Hello again. This is Math 2245 coming to you from the College of DuPage. And the title of this lecture is Inverse Matrices and Elementary Matrices. As always, please be an attentive learner while watching this video. Our main goal in this section is to define inverse matrices and to take a look at some properties involving these matrices. We won't actually be finding the inverses in this section, that will come soon. Uh, but we will be taking a quick look at elementary matrices and we'll see that these help us find the inverse matrices. Uh, we'll use them to devise a method for finding inverse matrices. So let's start with the definition of the inverse matrix. Definition 1. If A is a square matrix, and we can find another matrix of the same size, B, such that A times B is equal to B times A is equal to I, then we call A invertible, and we say that B is an inverse of the matrix A. If we can't find such a matrix B, we will call A a singular matrix or a non-invertible matrix. Note that, the we, that we will uh, only talk about inverse matrices for square uh, matrices. And also note that if A is invertible, it will be called non-singular. That's another term for invertible. We should also point out that we can say that B is invertible and that A is the inverse of B. Before proceeding, we need to show that for the inverse of a matrix is uni unique. Note that we only talk about inverse matrices for square matrices. Also note that if A is invertible, it will on, on occasion be called non-singular. We also point out that we could say that B is invertible and that A is the inverse of B. Before proceeding, we need to show that the inverse of a matrix is, in fact, unique. That is, for a given invertible matrix A, there's exactly one such inverse. In fact, this is a theorem that we will prove. So suppose that A is invertible, and that both B and C are inverses of, of A. Then we will show that B is equal to C, and that will then be denoted as A raised to the minus 1, or A inverse. Here's the proof. Since B is an inverse of A, we know that A times B is equal to C. Now multiply both sides of this, A, B equal uh, I, on both sides uh, by C, and we get C, parentheses A, B equals C, I is equal to C. But then we can use the associative law for matrix multiplication and associate um, the C and the A, as well as uh, the A and the B. And we will get that uh, C times A, B is equal to parentheses C, A, B, uh, equal I, B, equal B. Therefore, you see, uh, if we put these pieces together, we see that C is equal to C times A, B, because this was the identity which is equal to uh, B, so C equal B. So the inverse for matrix is unique. And so again, we will call this A inverse from now on. So here's an example. Uh, we're to verify that the indicated matrix A inverse is an inverse of this. Well, all we need to do is multiply the two uh, things together, and we'll multiply on both sides because that's the definition that we have now. So A times A inverse, you do the matrix multiplication, you'll get the identity. And A inverse times A is equal to identity. Again, you should be checking these calculations. So as the definition of an inverse matrix suggests, not every matrix will have an inverse. And here's an example of a matrix that does not have an inverse. So this matrix does not have an inverse. And uh, the easiest way to see it is uh, that uh, what we're going to do is we're going to take uh, uh, B, the second row of B, times C. 
the matrix C, which is a general matrix that we have here. Now, anytime we do this, we're going to have 0 times this, which means that we're going to get 0, 0, 0 as um, the uh, second row of BC. But it would have to have a 1 in it, and since it doesn't, that means this is not invertible. So the second row is this. But if C is the inverse of B, the product must give you this as the second row. Now, C was a general 3 by 3 matrix, so we've shown that the second row uh, is all 0 no matter what. And so it can never be the identity matrix. So B can't have an inverse, and so is a singular matrix. Uh, we expand... Uh, our notion of exponents uh, to negative exponents. So a to the minus n is the inverse of a raised to the n. So it's the inverse multiplied times itself n times if it exists. Let's compute a to the minus 3 for this matrix. Now we already know from an earlier example that a inverse was this. So we're going to take a inverse times a inverse times a inverse this one times this one gives us this you should verify these calculations and this times this is equal to this so a to the minus 3 is equal to this 2 by 2 matrix now let's take a look at some uh, important facts about inverse matrices so suppose that A and B are invertible matrices of the same size. Then the product A times B is invertible. And in fact, we have a formula that the inverse of A times B is B inverse times A inverse. Uh, A inverse is invertible. And the inverse of the inverse is the original matrix. The inverse of A to the N is A to the minus N and that's the same thing as the product of the inverse n times. And if C is any non-zero sca scalar, CA is also invertible, and the inverse of CA is 1 over C times the inverse of A. And last, the transpose of an uh, invertible matrix is also invertible, and A transpose inverse is equal to A inverse transpose. Now, to prove uh, each of these, all we need to show uh, that the inverse is what we claim to be, and so it's not, uh, it's not too bad. Um, so, for example, let's start with trying to show that AB inverse is equal to B inverse A. Well, this is just the notation we use to denote the inverse of AB, and so we're going to start By, uh, and we'll want to show this. So we're going to take AB times B inverse A. But we can use the associative property to uh, associate B times B inverse, which is going to be I. And that will make this AA inverse, which is in fact I. When we do the uh, on the other side, we'll have B inverse A inverse times AB. Again, we'll use the associative property twice and get I back again. So you see we've shown that the inverse of AB is B inverse times A inverse. Let's move to prove uh, property uh, B. Uh, so we know that uh, A is invertible, so we have A inverse, A times A inverse is equal to A inverse A is equal to I. But if we multiply on both sides uh, by uh, A inverse, uh, uh, we will get the uh, identity matrix. That's what we've done here. But that's exactly what we needed to show, that A inverse is invertible. There is something, namely A, that we can multiply both sides by. Part C. The best way to prove this is perhaps by using mathematical induction, but we haven't really talked about that in this class, and so uh, we're proving it another way. So what we need to do is multiply A inverse to the uh, A to the nth power times a to the minus n. Well, this is a times itself n times, and this is a inverse times itself n times by definition. So again, we use the associative property in the middle, and then we have n minus 1 
a a inverse n minus 1 a inverse times itself. But this is equal to the i, so we keep doing it over and over and over again and getting i. And so we can show from the other side in the same way. So a to the nth inverse is equal to a to the minus n. Uh, and this equals a inverse raised to the nth power. Now to prove this, we have to show that c times a, 1 over c times a inverse, is equal to the identity. Well, we just are going to be um, uh, grouping, as we can with scalar multiplication, c times c inverse, which gives us 1. And what's left is a times a inverse, which is i. So that proves part d. In part e, we have to show that a transpose times a inverse transpose is equal to a inverse transpose times a transpose equals i. Well, this one is a, seems a little trickier, but it's not really too bad. Let's start with a times a inverse transpose. But remember that the transpose, uh, the product of two transpose is CD to the transpose. So using this fact backwards on A transpose, A inverse transpose gives us this. But inside we have I, but the transpose of I is I. So we've proven that I transpose equals I, and you could verify that. And so this fundamentally, uh, you have to repeat it from the other side. But this uh, will tell you that the uh, A transpose inverse is A inverse transpose. And uh, note that the first part of this theorem says that we can also uh, expand this to A, B, C inverse is equal to a c inverse b inverse a inverse now we're going to return to something that we said in an earlier section that we don't have a cancellation law or zero property law however if we do restrict ourselves a little that is assuming that a is an invertible ma matrix then if we have a b times a c then b equals c we get that by operating on the left-hand side by A inverse. Both times we can conclude that B equals C. Similarly, if AD is equal to 0 and A is invertible, we operate on the left by A inverse, and we get that D is 0. So if we're talking about invertible matrices, then this is a theorem. Note that this theorem only required that A is invertible, so the other matrices could be sim uh, singular. Note as well with the first one that we uh, got to remember that matrix multiplication is not commutative. So if we have AB equals CA, there's no reason to think that B equals C uh, because we don't know that A that CA is equal to AC. We have to leave this as is. Also, when we multiply both sides of the equation by A inverse, we've got to multiply uh, each side on the left or on the right. And again, we don't have commutative uh, law for these. So if we tried the proof, we would crash and burn. Now we're going to turn our attention to elementary matrices. A square matrix is called an elementary matrix if it can be obtained by applying a single elementary row operation, which we defined early in the course, to the identity matrix of the same size. And so here's some examples of elementary matrices and the row operations that produced them. Okay, so if we uh, multiply 9 times row 1 and we operate on I, we get this. So this is a matrix that will uh, multiply the first row by 9 and replace it. Here, if we want to exchange row 1 and row 4 on I4, we'll multiply by this row. And you notice that um, you see row 1 is here, and that what we had for row 4 was up here. We multiply by that I, we get um, this effect on the matrix that we use. Uh, here, uh, we can take row 2 minus row 
minus 7 times row 3, this will give us that. And again, you should be verifying this, and we will get um, that on I4. And here is just multiplying by 1 uh, on I3, because what we have is um, the identity matrix. Note that the fourth example shows that any identity matrix is also an elementary matrix, since we can think of arriving at that matrix by taking 1 times any row. Now, there's a really nice theorem about elementary matrices, and we'll use this very much when we develop a method for finding the inverse. So here's the theorem. And the theorem uh, is pretty easy to prove. You just really have to think through it. Suppose that E is an elementary matrix that we found by applying an elementary row operation on IN. Then if A is an N by M matrix, EA is a matrix that results by applying the same row operation to A. So you see, you can think about all those elementary row operations as being uh, completed uh, by having multiplying by elementary matrices. In fact, uh, here's an example. So in example five, uh, we're going to do the rotate uh, the uh, operation uh, row one plus four row two, uh, and this is going to become uh, the new uh, the new row two. And so uh, what you see is this is going to become the new row one. Excuse me. Here's a really nice theorem about elementary matrices, and we'll use this extensively when we develop a method for finding the inverse of a matrix. Uh, so the theorem says, suppose that E is an elementary uh, matrix that was found by applying an elementary row operation on IN, the identity, the n-dimensional identity matrix. Then if A is an M by N matrix, EA is the matrix that will result by applying the same row operation to A. So for example, for the following matrix, the row operation, row 1 plus 4 times row 2 on it, uh, and you want to find the uh, elementary uh, matrix A that will do this and verify that EA gives us the result that we want. So here's the A we start with, and this is the E. Now this will uh, take row 1 and add it to uh, 4 times row 2, and this will become the new row 1. And you can see that performing this operation gives us this, and if we multiply this, matrix times that, we will also get this. And you should, again, verify these calculations. And here is verifying it. We take this one times this one and get the same thing. So you see uh, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between these elementary uh, matrices in elementary row operations. Uh, here's another example. Uh, give the operation that will take the elementary matrix from example 4 uh, back to the original matrix. Well, we're, what that's going to do, this was uh, 9, 0, 0, 1. We need to take it back to the identity. So we have to multiply by 1 over 9, uh, row 1. And, uh, and, and then we have to, um, uh, you know, that that's, we'll show that in just a minute. And also, what will... What matrix will we use to change to interchange row one and row four? So from here to here. Okay. Well, this is the one where we take row two plus uh, uh, seven times uh, row three. It's this one. Getting that, and this is one times that. Now, so you see, we do have these uh, inverse operations that exist. And uh, so we can do all of these inverse operations via row operations and in turn by multiplying by elementary matrices. And that is uh, now that we've got inverse operations, we also have this theorem. So suppose that E is the elementary matrix associated with a particular row operation, and that E0 is the elementary row operation associated with its inverse operation. Then E 
is invertible, and in fact, not really surprising, is the inverse of E is that uh, reverse operation. And the proof really is pretty simple. Start with E, 0 times E. We know from theorem 4 that this is the same as if we applied the inverse operation to E. But we know the inverse operation will take an elementary matrix back to its original identity matrix. Therefore, we have E0 times E is equal to I. Likewise, if we look at E times E0, this is the same as applying the original row operation to uh, E0. However, if you think about this, you will only undo the inverse operation did to the identity matrix, and so we have E, E0 is I. So we've proven that E inverse is equal to the inverse operations. Now suppose that we have two matrices of the same size, A and B. If we can reach B by applying a finite number of row operations to A, then we're going to call the two matrices row equivalent. Note that this also means we can get from A, get, reach A from B by applying the inverse operations in the reverse order. And here we'll uh, look at this with, uh, with some example. So we have A being this matrix and B being this matrix. Now these are two row equivalents because we reached B by multiplying row 2 of A by minus 2 and adding 3 times row 1 onto row 2. And for practice, let's do the operation using elementary matrices. So here are the elementary matrices and their inverses for these operations. So for minus 2, R2, this is the elementary operation. And this is the inverse of that elementary operation. And the operation of row 2 plus 3 times row uh, 1 is given by this E2. And this is the inverse of E2. You should verify these calculations. So if we take A, then we multiply by E1 and E2, or in the reverse order, E2 times E1 times A. We get this, this, and we get B. So that's B as we would expect. Now, as we learned in the theorem, uh, since A and B are row equivalent, this means we should be able to get to A from B by applying the inverse operations in the reverse order. Let's see that that, in fact, does work. So here is E1 inverse, E2 inverse, and B. You should verify these calculations, but you see in turn that gets us back to A. So we do end up with the correct matrix, and uh, so we can see that each time we multiply the left side by an elementary matrix, theorem 4 tells us it's the same thing as applying the associated row matrix. We are now poised to be able to compute the inverse of an invertible matrix. In closing, now more than ever, time is precious. Each day must count. Do the math. It will make you strong. And now more than ever, take care of yourself and each other. Self-care is important, and we're all in this together. God bless you all.